in prison, they put me on the same yard as one of the guys that I had shot. When I tell people this, they go, well, how is that possible? Like, don't they keep records of these things? And the problem is people don't take into account the fact that people in prison were often victims of crime long before and more numerously than they committed crimes themselves because they learned that behavior from somewhere. So whether they were victims of child abuse or assault or robbery, they learned that behavior. So what they do is they check your record when you get somewhere. So like when I got to the jail, they ran my charges and they said, hey, two of the family members of the house that you robbed are here, so we're gonna keep you away from them. And I said, okay, cool. And then a few months later, they actually put me in the block with one of them, so it didn't really make any difference. But then when I got to the Department of Corrections, they ran my record and they were like, hey, two of the family members of the house you robbed are in the system, but like, we're gonna keep you away from them. And again, they pretty promptly put me in the pod with one of them, but the guy that I had shot wasn't in the Department of Corrections yet, so he never came up. So when I got from not away to Buckingham, I got there and I was sitting in the pod and I was talking to somebody and he was like, man, you look really familiar. And I said, yeah, sorry, I don't remember you. He said, were you on the news or anything? And I was like, yeah, you know, my case was kind of a big deal. I was on the news. And he said, man, are, are you the guy who shot those guys on 29? I said, yeah, that was me. He goes, well, so-and-so's right down the hall. And I was like, well, um, like this is gonna be interesting. Like, what do I do here? So I said to him, look, I'm completely in the wrong. Like, this was not a decent situation. I have no excuse. I'm not gonna let this guy hurt me, but if he wants to resolve this, if there's any way we can make peace, if there's any way we can move forward, please let him know. Like, if he wants to meet, I'll meet him on the yard. If he wants to talk, if he wants to fight, like whatever, that's on him, but I'm in the wrong and I accept responsibility and I don't want any problems. So he said, all right, cool, I'm gonna talk to him. So the next day I walked in, and I walked in the chow hall and immediately saw him. And I hadn't seen him, this was like the second or third day I'd been there, and I hadn't seen him before, but I immediately recognized him. I was like, oh my God, like, so I go sit down in the chow hall and I'm watching him, I'm waiting to see, and he was smiling, he clearly hadn't heard yet. The guy in my pod hadn't told him yet. I saw him sit at the table with this guy, I saw his face get all kind of balled up and I saw him run back. I was like, okay, like, we'll see what happens. So that day we were supposed to meet at rec. So I was out on the rec yard and I was on the weight pile and I was doing pull-ups and I had a bad shoulder so I shouldn't have been doing pull-ups, but that was allowing me to watch the gate, to watch who was coming out because that way it was like, he can't sneak up on me. I can see who's coming out. Like I can watch what's going on. So if he tries to get me, I can at least get away or defend myself. So nobody comes out. I'm going, okay, you know, maybe this isn't a big deal or maybe things are going to be peaceful or whatever. So as soon as I go in, uh, the COs are at my door and they're like, yo, pack your stuff. So I go, look what's going on. And I have an idea, obviously what's going on, but I wanted to figure out if they would tell me anything. So I pack my stuff and they're walking me down to the hole and the sergeant finally says, he said, yeah, apparently like you, you did something to somebody and like they don't feel comfortable being on the yard with you. It's like, okay. So I'm down in the hole and they say, okay, you're gonna be back here, but we're gonna let you back out. Whether it's today or tomorrow, we're not sure. We're trying to figure out what to do. So about four hours later, they take me to the watch commander's office and then they take me to the back to the assistant warden's office. And they do this in handcuffs. And it's like, I wasn't a threat like four hours ago, but like now I'm in a threat to be in handcuffs and shackles. They take me in there and he says, oh, we have a very serious situation. I go, okay. He said, well, apparently one of the men that you shot is here and he fears for his life. I was like, okay. He said, so how do you feel about that? I mean, how am I supposed to feel about that? Like, I feel terrible about shooting him. Do I feel bad that you put me on the same camp as him? Like that you administratively moved me here? No, I don't feel bad about that, but I'm glad that we're coming to a peaceful resolution that nothing bad is happening. He was really upset for some reason. Like he was not like just understanding of the fact that I didn't choose to come there. Like I didn't choose to be on that camp. Anyways, they sent me back to the hole and about an hour later, they moved me back to my cell and they had emergency transferred him from that prison to the one across the street. So at that point, all these rumors started and all these things going, and people started talking bad about this guy and said, oh man, he snitched and he should have done this and he should have done that. And what he did was think about his family. He thought about what he was doing or he was genuinely afraid. Whatever the case, he avoided the conflict. So many times in prison, I see people have two options. Say, I can go left and stay out of trouble or I can go right and prove my ego or prove my point or look tough in front of somebody. And they always go right. And this guy chose to go left. He chose to save himself, he chose to save me, because he very easily could have killed me. As much as I was on my P's and Q's, he could have found one day and snuck up behind me and stuck a knife in my neck. So he saved my life, he saved the conflict from happening, and he was able to go home to his kids. Like, that made the most sense to me. So when people were talking trash about him, I always pulled up and was like, nah, y'all can't say nothing about that. Like, he didn't do anything wrong, he made the right decision to go home. All this, like, prison first, like, tough guy stuff, y'all can take that somewhere else, because I don't have time for this. And this was fairly early in my bid. This was before I even fully matured, but I understood I wanted to go home. I had seen too many things. I had seen too many ugly stories. I'd seen too many guys who came in with five years or 10 years and had life sentences now to want to be involved in those politics. And too often it's the guys in prison that want to prove a point or make a name, but there's some systems where people feel like they don't have a choice. They have to do that. 
In Virginia, luckily, I didn't. In Virginia, luckily, you can walk to the side. You can walk away from most things. Not everything, but most things. So anytime somebody made that decision, I applauded them for it. And I would encourage guys to do that. Guys would come to me like, man, what am I do? Like, should I get this guy? And I was like, well, do you want to be here? Do you like talking to me here in this prison setting? Like, do you like hanging out and going to wreck and going to the chow hall and eat bad food? Because if you don't, you probably shouldn't get this guy. You should probably find another way out. You should find another resolution. And people might talk about you. They might talk bad about you. You know what? That's great for them. They can talk bad about you from in here while you're out there on the street. So people always had that mindset. And I always encouraged them to make the right decision. And my thing was, look, you don't have to go out and tell on people. You don't have to go out and create problems. You don't have to go out and get in people's business. But your number one priority should be getting home to your family, getting home to your kids, getting home to make good decisions. And I am incredibly grateful that the guy I shot chose that decision. And he took that path because, again, he saved me just like he saved himself.